Hey, beloved, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Book of Revelation. This is now session 28. In the last two sessions, the last two weeks, I spent some time in chapter 10 looking at the mighty angel with a little scroll, arguing that the most likely interpretation is to understand that angel as referring to Jesus. Uh, that all of the descriptions concerning this angel seem to point to his divinity and specifically focus on language that we would understand to be applying to the return of Jesus. It's intending to sort of give us a picture or at the very least sort of hearkening toward the fact that he's about to return. It's, it's giving us pictures that are indicative of his return. In this session, I'm going to address the issue of the coming rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. We're going to look at the first two verses in chapter 11. Now before I do that, I actually want to pause for a moment and go back into chapter 10. I want to read the last few verses in chapter 10 and then the first few verses here in chapter 11 because I want to make one final point that I intended to make before I ended last session and I forgot. But I think it's an interesting point and it's worth highlighting. Okay, so before we jump into the issue of the temple specifically, we're going to start in chapter 10 verses 8 through 11. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking to me. Okay, so John the apostle, he's standing before the mighty angel with a little scroll. He hears a voice from heaven. He says, I heard it again. What is this voice from heaven saying? Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the messenger. Okay, angel just really means messenger. It, it, it's used in a broad sense throughout the scriptures. So we need to be careful going, but Jesus is not just an angel, not just an angel, but at times God does appear in the form of a messenger, the angel of the Lord. Again, we've addressed this pretty extensively. And he says, go take the book, which is an open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel. John starts talking to the angel. He says, I went to the angel and I told him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it. So John is having a conversation with the angel. He hears this voice from heaven, and then either the voice from heaven or the angel or both of them say, you have to keep prophesying concerning nations, kings, etc. And then, what's interesting is the NASB says this, then they said to me, they? Okay, so now if the NASB is accurate, they is both the voice from heaven as well as the angel together are speaking together. And the voice says, or they say, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So this is the commission and the mandate to complete prophesying and explain everything else that is in the remainder of the scroll that's been opened. Again, we discussed that a bit at the end of last session. But here's, here's the part that I want to focus in on, is what voice is talking? Who, who is speaking to John? Then as we turn to chapter 11, it says, Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. On the other hand, leave out the outer court because that's been given to the Gentiles. Again, we're going to dig into this in, in quite some detail. And they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. That's a familiar time frame. That's three and a half years. But then we get to verse 3 and 4. And the same voice that's telling him to measure the temple says, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses. So here's the thing. I'm not dogmatic. I'm not, you know, overly uh, definitive on this point. But it seems to be, if we simply read the flow from chapter 10 into 11, it seems to be that John is in conversation with the angel who says, take the scroll and eat it. It's going to be bitter in your mouth. I mean, it's going to be sweet in your mouth and then bitter in your stomach. And he takes it. And then in a voice that continues. It's either from heaven or it's the angel or it's both. It says, and you have to continue to prophesy. And then someone gives him this measuring rod, measure the temple. And the same voice says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses. So again, I'm not dogmatic. This is not definitive. But it seems to be that it's the mighty angel himself who says, I'm going to grant authority to my two witnesses. Now, it could be in concert with the voice from heaven. Again, I want to be clear. But it doesn't seem to just cut him out of the picture. So if the two witnesses are the angel's two witnesses, the mighty angel's two witnesses, then that really is sort of the final nail in the coffin in terms of the arguments for this mighty angel actually being Jesus himself in the form of the angel of the Lord, this majestic, mighty, amazing angel. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Again, as I said, not dogmatic, 
but interesting and worthy of, of highlighting. So now I want to jump back to verses 1 and 2 in chapter 11, because this is really what we want to zero in on. Listen, this issue of the temple is an incredibly critical, important issue, wildly controversial within the broader body of Christ, wildly controversial, but it's an issue that we need to have clarity on because the scriptures are clear and because it is one of the primary definitive issues that the scriptures want us to understand and focus on and zero in on. Like it's, it's a marker, it's something that should be recognized by the church, yet ironically if it were to just happen overnight today, I think the church would be in tremendous uh, conflict over this issue without having clarity in terms of what the Word of God says. So it's so important that we have clarity on this. And I hope I can do it justice in this brief session. So again, chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Then there was given me a measuring rod, and someone said... So now it's interesting, it says, and someone said. That's the NASB. That word someone is actually not in the text. It's just, and then was said. A more literal translation is, and then was said. Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar, and those who worship in it. Now, this act of measuring, it's not primarily about, well, what is the distance? Because we're never told, like, well, you know, it's 34 cubits or, you know, 9 meters or 10 feet or, you know, whatever. Like, we're not given measurements. And, of course, then it goes on and it says, and measure the, the worshipers. Actually, measure the worshipers. Like, that would be offensive, especially for us shorter guys, you know, because we're all... <laughs> or whatever, male fragility, we're insecure, you know, like, what do you mean 5'7"? I used to be 5'8 back in college, you know. <laughs> it was like stretching because John's measure. Like, okay, it's not primarily about units of measurement. The term measure is inferring the idea of assessing, assessing sort of the value and the spiritual nature of this whole thing. And yet we're not given tremendous insight. It's just sort of this passing statement. But the issue, although it is a measuring staff like a rod, you know, you're to take... We're never told, and, and it is weird to measure the people. Okay, now, you know, like, I'm the, John's out there, like, I'm the tailor, and he's like, woo, you know, your waist got big. He's not, like, going around measuring everybody, or at least, I don't know, it seems weird to me. So get up and measure the temple of God and the altar, which, again, is an integral part of the temple, as well as those who worship in the temple. But don't measure. Leave out the outer court, which is outside of the temple, and don't measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. English translation says the nations, but it's the Gentiles. It's been given to the Gentiles, and then specifically, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. That's three and a half years. The term there, tread underfoot, it's not simply, oh, they got their muddy footprints all over the new carpet, you know. It is trampling underfoot. It is crushing it, like squishing grapes under your feet, okay? It's it's intended to convey violence. And when you look at the overwhelming consensus of other verses that describe this, it's clear. It's a desolation. It's not just a spiritual desolation. It is a desecration, a destruction is another term that's used for the temple. So here are the first two questions that most of the body of Christ will ask. First of all, they're going to say, is Revelation 11 referencing a literal future rebuilt temple in Jerusalem? And I fully wholeheartedly believe that it is, and I believe the scriptures validate that, and we're going to look at the scriptures. Second, and the, this is an incredibly controversial issue, the question is, if so, if this temple will be rebuilt, how should we as Christians view this temple, and how should we view the sacrifices? And the reason this is such an interesting question is because half of the body of Christ today, those that come from a more of a replacement theology, traditional, amillennialist perspective, they're most often going to say that if a temple would be rebuilt, it itself would be blasphemy. It would be blasphemous. Sacrifices after the once and for all complete sacrifice of Christ would be blasphemy. Okay? That's a, that's a huge statement. We're going to discuss that as we move on. But let me just begin by saying affirming, yes, wholeheartedly, there will be a literal future temple rebuilt of some kind, of some kind rebuilt up there on the Temple Mount. Um, the temple and the sacrifices, according to the scriptures, should be and will be holy. They should be viewed as holy because the scriptures say they're holy and they belong to God. That's an important point. Now, it's a huge issue in terms of addressing the issue of sacrifices, both in the future and in the millennium. 
I, I'm not going to really delve into that too deep, too deeply, but it's a very important issue that we do need to discuss somewhat. And then, of course, the sacrifices will specifically be stopped. The temple will be desolated by the Antichrist. So the question that will come from the skeptics or the critics, um, most often, again, within evangelicalism, they'll say, well, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, Joel. Doesn't the New Testament frequently refer to our body as the temple? Doesn't it refer to the temple in a metaphorical sense? And shouldn't we understand all references in the New Testament, including Revelation 11, shouldn't we understand that in a metaphorical, spiritualized sense? Okay, so again, that's the question that will be asked. Now, just as a little bit of school class, okay, you've got two words in the New Testament for temple. You've got heron and naos. Okay, heron is used 72 times in a broader sense for the greater temple complex, okay, but it's also used once specifically for the temple of Artemis. That's in Acts 19, 27, Paul's preaching, and it refers to Artemis' temple using the word Huron. So Huron is sort of a general term, which means temple, but in the context of the New Testament, overwhelmingly it's pointing to the larger temple complex. Then you've got the word naos, again in the Greek, and that's used 32 times in the New Testament, specifically for the temple in Jerusalem, but more specifically and most specifically for the holy of holies, for the holy place, sort of the center, the inner sanctum, the holy place within the temple where God dwells, so to speak. You've also got two references in the New Testament of naos being used for a heathen or a pagan temple. And then you've got nine different times in the New Testament where it is used metaphorically or spiritually. And we're not going to read all nine of those verses, but let's just look at a couple of them because, again, we want to validate this and affirm this. Yes, it's used in a metaphorical or spiritual sense. Jesus himself was a temple of, the, of God. He, he himself is God, but he also was indwelt, just like you and I are, by the Holy Spirit. John 2, verse 19, Jesus answered them and he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now, they all thought he meant destroy this temple. He's pointing to the building, but he was actually, as it says two verses later, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Okay, now how is a body a temple? Because God lives in it. The Holy Spirit dwells in Jesus, and he dwells in us as well. Also, you have multiple places where we are called the temple of God, not just Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you are a temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. The scriptures refer to us as being a habitation of God. His Spirit dwells in us as a down payment, as a seal, as a guarantee of our future inheritance in the kingdom of God. It is a seal, a down payment, a deposit, as the King James says, an earnest. The Lord says, you've got this, that's a seal, that's a guarantee, but I dwell in you. And then he goes on in verse 17, if any man destroys, defiles, abominates, desolates the temple of God, God will destroy him because the temple of God is holy. But that does not do away with the fact that we are also the temple of God. And the fact that we are the temple of God does not do away with the fact that God has dwelt in literal temples in the past. Now, people say after Christ, the, temp the veil of the temple was rent, this and that. But here's the thing, guys, and again, I don't want to get into this in too much detail. Paul the Apostle, long after the cross, long after the veil was rent, he went and engaged in sacrifices in the temple. It says so in the book of Acts. He didn't call it unholy. He didn't call it blasphemous. He treated it as holy. And it wasn't just because he was just jumping through the hoops to make the Jews happy. He wasn't just being an insider. He wasn't just contextualizing so as to sort of deceive them. He took the Jewish temple rituals very seriously, and he engaged in them. He made vows. He made sacrifices. It was not a cynical act, okay? It was not a deceptive act. So let's go ahead and just survey the most important texts that address this particular issue, that address this issue of the temple. So first of all, you've got four references in the book of Daniel. This is really the first place to really look is within the book of Daniel. And if you guys have been around with the Maranatha Bible study since the book of Daniel last year, um, kudos to you. We reviewed some of this stuff, but it's always good to do a little refresher. So Daniel 8, verse 11. As we read these, I want to zero in on two themes. One, do the scriptures say that there will be a literal temple rebuilt? Is it literal? Is it using the language, uh, is it using literal language that we should understand literally? And two, does it describe it as blasphemous or does it describe it as holy? Those are the two things that we want to zero in on. 
And then we'll come back and, and sort of discuss a few other issues. Okay, so Daniel, not, uh, Daniel 8, verse 11. The little horn, that's the Antichrist in context, it says it even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. The commander of the host, of course, is God. You could even say Jesus. Yahweh the Father, Yahweh the Son, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him. So the Antichrist, the little horn, will remove the regular sacrifice. It will take it away from the commander of the host. So he exalts himself to be equal to God, and then he takes away his, his sacrifice. It calls it his sacrifice. It belongs to him. And then the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. Whose sanctuary? God's. It calls the temple... God's sanctuary, his sanctuary. The sanctuary belongs to the commander of the host, as does the sacrifices. And it uses language that we should understand as literal, okay? It uses the events. Daniel uses the events, the historical events, when Antiochus Epiphanes IV entered Jerusalem and committed all kinds of abominations. He made Torah illegal. He persecuted and killed tens of thousands of Jews who did not submit to his efforts to paganize Jerusalem. He sacrificed a pig up on the Temple Mount. Antiochus is the greatest foreshadow of the Antichrist in all of Scripture. It's the main issue that's focused on by the prophets, by Daniel, in great detail. Antiochus is the greatest example in picture and foreshadow of what the Antichrist will do, what he will look like when he comes. Skipping forward to chapter 9, uh, in ver the last verse, verse 27, he, that's the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant or strong covenant with the many for one week, for one seven-year cycle. Shavuot, Shavuot, uh, however you say it in Hebrew exactly. But in the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven-year cycle, three and a half years in, the Antichrist will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. That's, it's very specific. Now, in terms of hermeneutics, in terms of hermeneutics, let's just say we're looking at the last several chapters of Ezekiel. Ezekiel gives us what can only be described as a blueprint of the future millennial temple. Like details like, and then there will be three steps that go to the east, and then three steps on the west, and then there'll be two windows here, and there'll be a lentil. It will be three cubits high. Like detailed measurements, pretty much in verbal form, the best thing that you could give in terms of a literal blueprint. Now, our amillennialist friends, our replacement theology friends that don't believe in a future literal millennium, they have no choice but to view these last several chapters of Ezekiel, again, from 40 on up, the last eight chapters, as being completely spiritual and metaphorical. But one of the basic principles of interpreting scripture is that you should understand what type of literature you're reading. Okay, you don't read, just in modern terms, we don't read a Winnie the Pooh book as though it is biblical. We don't read it as sacred literature. We don't read Winnie the Pooh as historical narrative. We don't read it as poetry, even though it has little subtle elements of poetry, you could say, in it. It's a children's book, and it should be understood as a children's book. When you are reading portions of the last several chapters of Ezekiel, it's clear it should be understood as a blueprint. But when you don't believe that there's ever going to be a temple rebuilt in the millennium, you don't even believe a millennium exists, you are forced by your system of interpretation, your assumptions, to read a particular piece of literature through a metaphorical spiritual lens. In real life, that's what schizophrenics do. That's what people with mental illnesses do. Again, I always use this example. If I come home and my wife has a list, a grocery list on the table, and I read it thinking that she's sending me deeper metaphorical spiritual messages, it's probably because I have a mental illness. Any approach to interpreting scripture that sees things that are clearly literal and just because of this assumption, again, this spiritualized amillennialist assumption that there is no literal millennium, we should just understand it as referring to our realities now, spiritually, etc. Any system that has that, that forces you to take portions of scripture that any face value reading is going to say this should be understood literally. Because you can't spiritualize three cubits and three steps to the west. Like you, either you have to just have this incredibly elaborate, crazy explanation, or you may as well just rip that part right out of the Bible and throw it away because it has no relevance. No relevance. 
It's one or the other. Something that's crazy and cuckoo, that's really a ridiculous stretch, or rip that thing out. If, on the other hand, we take it for what it is, which is a literal blueprint, then it's a blueprint. Then it has value. And people do. They look at it, they read it, and they create actual sort of diagrams of what the future millennial temple will look like. And it's fascinating. Here in Daniel, okay, as an example, and why did I just go off on that tangent? Here he says, the Antichrist will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Like he's just elaborating on some of the, the, the type of sacrifices that will be taking place. Now, if you interpret this as not real, as metaphorical, you have to have a very different interpretation of sacrifice versus grain offering. Like, what does grain offering spiritually and metaphorically mean as opposed to sacrifice? Like, you, you're forced to take ridiculous interpretations is the, is the point. And then it says, And on a wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. The Antichrist will make the temple desolate. For how long? Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So until the Antichrist is destroyed, the last three and a half years, the temple will be made desolate. The offerings will cease, and the temple will be made desolate. Now, it's interesting in the Septuagint, slightly different translation. The Septuagint says, again, verse 27, and one week shall establish the covenant with many. It's really no difference. There's going to be one week, a covenant will be established. And in the midst of the week, the Lord says, my sacrifice and drink offerings shall be taken away. My sacrifice and offerings. I thought they were blasphemous to God. The Lord calls it mine. Belongs to me. And on the temple shall be the abomination of desolations. Now, for those who argue that the temple, if it's ever rebuilt, and if sacrifices are ever reestablished, that's blasphemous. Christ is the once and all sacrifice. Any more sacrifices are blasphemy. Again, Paul didn't feel that way. But for those who do make that argument, citing a few passages here and there, you know, in, Ro in Hebrews and that sort of thing, and I get it, I would say that how can an abomination be, become an abomination by the Antichrist? Like if the Antichrist desolates that, God goes, who cares? I didn't care about it in the first place. It was already an abomination to me. No, the only way that you can desecrate, desolate something, is if it's previously holy. And that's exactly the language that we have here. Again, it's using literal language, and it's using the language that God says, these are my sacrifices, these are my drink offerings, or grain offerings. And it's going to be abominated by the Antichrist, but he's going to be destroyed. He's going to be desolated. The one who makes desolate will become desolate. He'll be destroyed by Jesus at the brightness of his appearing. Daniel 11, so we've looked at Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Daniel 11, verse 31. Forces from him, that's the Antichrist, they will arise. They will desecrate the sanctuary fortress. Again, talking about the temple. They will desecrate it. Why? Because it was previously holy for a period. At least the first three and a half years, we should view the temple as holy. Now, that doesn't mean, now I want to be clear, that doesn't mean across the boards that every Christian throughout the world needs to be making pilgrimage to Jerusalem and engaging in the sacrifices. That's not what I'm saying. But that also doesn't mean, it certainly does mean that we shouldn't call it blasphemy and something to be shunned completely. It's a very nuanced situation in the same way that how we relate to Torah today as Gentiles or as Messianic Jews is a complicated issue. And let me just say this, let me, let me recommend, there's actually two volumes that were put out by Dan Jester. Okay, great friend, amazing scholar within the Messianic community, Dan Jester, one other guy, and they've put out these two big books addressing the complex issue of Torah, Torah observance. How do we relate to it? How does a Gentile relate to it? How does a Jew relate to it? What aspects of Torah are things that we should consider implementing in our lives or not implementing? And it really breaks it down because it's a very complicated, it's not just like yes, no. It's not that simple. But once the temple itself is rebuilt, it, this controversy that exists right now in the body of Christ, it's going to explode. And that's why we need clarity on it now. I mentioned this back when I was teaching on Daniel. I said, listen up, Messianic leaders in the land of Israel. If you don't think that Torah observance is controversial right now, so for those that are watching that are not part of the Messianic community or they don't live in, 
in Israel, I mean, even issues of like kosher, you know, should I eat kosher, should I not, within Israel, as an example. Um, many of the Sabra, many of the native-born Israelis who become Messianic, a lot of them become a little more friendly to Torah observance. So, for example, they might eat kosher. They wouldn't eat pork. Well, within these congregations, many of the Russian immigrants, heck no, don't take my pork away. And they don't see that as important at all. And so, even as in the first century, even as in the first century today, those that are shepherding and stewarding these communities, they're dealing with a broad range of opinions. Then you expand that out into the greater non-Messianic, non-Jewish world. And then you throw the temple into the mix. And I'm just saying, I'm putting this out there. The scriptures say the day is coming when that temple will be rebuilt. You better as a shepherd and as a leader, especially, especially in a Jewish community with close proximity to this thing, better have clarity. Better be prepared for how to enter the storm of controversy that's going to rage when this time comes, when that temple will be rebuilt, and it may be soon. It could very well be soon. So forces from the Antichrist will arise. Again, they will desecrate the sanctuary fortress. They will do away with the regular sacrifice, and they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. All of these things, forces, the desecration of the fortress, the regular sacrifice, you can't spiritualize this. You know, well, what do the forces of the Antichrist represent? They represent forces from the Antichrist, right? Et cetera, et cetera. The same with every element of the, of the passage. Now um, we're going to skip Daniel 11, uh, uh, chapter 12, verse 11, where it also once again references the abomination. It's just referencing the time frame, how long. But it uses that term, abomination of desolation, or something close to it four times in the book of Daniel. Now later, Jesus in his Sermon on the End Times, his discourse that he gave up on the Mount of Olives, the Olivet Discourse, as we call it, in Matthew 24, 15 through 21, leaving out some portions here. Jesus said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet. Those who try to argue that you've got a few verses in the New Testament, nine to be specific, that use temple in a metaphorical sense, Therefore, we should retroactively impose a universal metaphorical understanding interpretation of that back into the Old Testament. Like, that is horrible hermeneutics. You do not reverse engineer. You do not start with the New Testament, form conclusions and assumptions, and then try to impose them back. The New Testament does not rewrite. It does not overwrite. It does not... Um, change, alter, reimagine the Old Testament. No, it affirms, it reiterates. Oftentimes it expands and it fills out information that was already laid in the Old Testament. And this is within hermeneutics, within the proper interpretation of Scripture. This is called the principle of first mention. Go back to the foundation. Go back to the Old Testament. Look at the places in the Bible where these particular subjects are first referenced. Understand how a first century Jew would have understood them and then interpret the New Testament according to those things. But don't just start with a particular book. Come up with some sort of very Gentile, Christian-centric interpretation, and then try to reverse engineer and impose that interpretation back into Daniel. It doesn't work that way. I mean, it just doesn't work. That's horrible hermeneutics. But notice that Jesus continues to take these things very literal. When you see it with your eyes, when you see the abomination, where? Up on the Temple Mount. That was spoken of by the prophet Daniel. When you see it standing in the holy place, Let the reader understand something that you'll see with your eyeballs, not something that you'll perceive mystically or spiritually as the Antichrist is infecting the church because they're the temple and like all these things. It's the holy place. There's even one interpretation that's floating around that because Erdogan, the president of Turkey, stepped into the Hagia Sophia, the Hagia Sophia, the the former largest church in the world there in Istanbul, that he is the Antichrist and he's standing in the holy place and all this stuff. No, that is horrible twisting of the scriptures, ripping things out of context. The holy place is the holy place in Jerusalem. That's where it's repeatedly referred to. That's where Jesus was when he gave the Sermon on the Mount. That's what he's talking about. Those are the questions that he's answering when his disciples say, when are all these things going to happen? It didn't have anything to do with Istanbul, for those of you that are even tracking with that idea that's floating around, you know, on the internet. And then he says this, that those who are in Judea, when they see this, They must flee to the mountains. Again, if you're trying to interpret this mystically, then you go, well, what do those who are in Judea spiritually represent within the church? It becomes absurd. 
It's literal. When you, if, if this happens and you're in southern Israel, get out. Bad stuff's about to break down. It should be understood as literal. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred from the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. And the context in the next few verses, the next several verses, is his return. It's the return of Jesus, the end of the age. It's not historical. Then will appear the sign of the coming of the Son of Man and the clouds and all this type of stuff. You can't move any of this back to the first century with Titus, with the Romans, that type of thing. This is clearly yet in the future. Paul the Apostle, expanding upon the words of Jesus, who was expanding upon the words of Daniel, or you could say Gabriel and the angels, that, or the Lord that was speaking through, or the Lord who was speaking through Gabriel, through Daniel, etc. Paul the Apostle now in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, he says this, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come, that's the catching away, the rapture, unless the apostasy happens first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or object of worship. Remember, he will exalt himself to be equal to the commander of the host. Paul is actually alluding back to Daniel 8 as well as some references in Daniel 11, right there in verse 42-ish. And then Paul says, the Antichrist will take his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. So the Antichrist, by virtue of sitting in God's seat, God's throne, that will be the act itself of declaring himself as God. The reason I say that is because he's not claiming to be the God of the temple, because back in Daniel 11, it already told us that he will say unheard of monstrous things against the God of gods. He will speak monstrous blasphemies against the God of the Bible. So he can't say, God is a horrible, incompetent, pathetic God, I'm him. Okay, that doesn't work. The blasphemy that the Antichrist will engage in is against God. It's not, Jesus was accused of blasphemy for claiming to be God. The Antichrist will be, commit blasphemy by speaking out against God and exalting himself to be equal to or above God. There's a difference between those two types of blasphemies. So again, Paul reiterates that the Antichrist will desolate the temple. He will sit in the temple and essentially make God's throne, God's earthly throne, his throne. Tremendous act of blasphemy if we understand the ancient Near Eastern Jewish understanding of what the temple represents. It is God's earthly, the extension of God's heavenly throne extended on the earth over his subjects. The Antichrist will take a seat in the temple of God. He doesn't call it the blasphemous temple. He takes his seat in the temple of God. How does it refer to it in Revelation 11? Measure the temple of God. It's called God's temple. He calls it my sacrifices. They will be holy. They will be holy. And that will tremendously challenge traditional evangelical scholarship. When these things, or just traditional evangelical theology and prejudices. The Lord is going to shake all of us. So then finally we get back to Revelation 11. Now we have the Apostle John. There was given him a measuring rod and a staff. Someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the outer court. Very detail-rich passage. Unless you want to try to interpret this all mystically, it's just speaking very clearly. There is no way in the world, yes, of course, we are the temple of God. That does not undermine or, or overwrite or do away with the fact that the foundational passages throughout Daniel, in the Olivet Discourse, Paul, and here in Revelation are speaking literally. The temple will be rebuilt. The Antichrist will desolate it, abominate it. He will cause offerings to cease. It's really very straightforward. It's not nearly as difficult as many people have, have made it. Now, what will this temple look like? And let me just say this. While we affirm that the scriptures are clear that there will be a temple rebuilt, it could be something as simple as a tent. It could be something that gets whipped up overnight. It could be a brick and, you know, brick and mortar structure, all right? But it could be something as simple as a tent. Again, it will be up on the Temple Mount. Now, let me just say this as an interesting point. Uh, this is a hot button issue. Um, I see people, you know, send me these articles. I saw one recently from one of these um, very popular end time sort of 
voices on YouTube, Israel News Today or something. Um, what's his name? He calls himself Ben, Stephen Ben Noon. And he had some article up there saying, imminent, the temple's about to be rebuilt. Um, Naftali Bennett, you know, has all these plans. He's religious and he's, he's about to build the third temple. And then you look at the article that he's citing and it's like seven or eight years old and it's breaking and this type of thing. Listen, that stuff, it's sensational. It gets news. There's nothing present that says any day the Jews are ready to rebuild the temple. The Israelis, the government in particular, are very hesitant. Now, yes, they do want more Jewish rights to go up there and pray and that type of thing. The time is coming, however, and there are Jews, absolutely religious Jews, that want to see that temple rebuilt. And there's interest, even among secular Israelis, just by virtue of, hey, this is ours too. Like, even if I don't care about the temple, I think it's only fair that we do share this thing because it is, does belong to us. Like, there's kind of that sentiment. And there's some sort of, I'll say, even among the secular Israelis, almost like this sort of mystical New Agey, like, yeah, like, I'm sure that would be a portal to positive vortexes and good vibes. You know, like, there's almost kind of this friendliness toward Judaism, but not really. You know what I mean? So there's some of that. There is interest within Jewish society for it, but for the most part, it's, it's more minority. But there are those. I've talked to, for example, uh, Yehuda Glick. He's a Temple Mount activist, and he actually became part of the Knesset. And, you know, yes, he would love to see the temple rebuilt, and I've talked to him. And I, t I spoke years ago with um, Rabbi Hollander. He was the foreign minister uh, for the nascent Sanhedrin in Israel. I talked to them both um, with regard to their plans. What do you want to do? And they said they simply want to build an addition onto the side of the Dome of the Rock, the Golden Dome. They want to build an addition sort of next to it. Um, and by the way, that is where I do believe the temple was, and I do believe that's where it will, will be. There are those, um, I'm friends with uh, Robert Bob Cornuke, who's written a book arguing that the temple is down there in the city of David, and I know many people have read his books or listened to his lectures and been influenced by that. And I go, that's, he makes some interesting points. He's drawing from some information from some previous scholars, by the way. Um, but I also have a good friend named Christian Widener. We went to Mount Sinai, hiked Mount Sinai together. And he's written a book recently called The Temple Revealed, in which he argues for the temple actually being up there on the Temple Mount. And I actually think that Christian makes a much better case. Now, in the big picture, like, we're not all specialists and archaeologists, and we're not time travelers, so we can't say definitively, but I think the evidence leans in favor of it being up there in the temple. But in the big picture, because what happens is a lot of Christians, they follow Bob Cornuke, and they go, oh, this solves everything. We can just build the temple down here, now we can build the temple, and, uh, you know, everyone's happy, and the Muslims aren't going to be freaking out because we're not up there on the Temple Mount, right? The problem with that is that it doesn't matter what some Christians think, because the Israeli... Jews, the religious Jews, and the Israeli archaeologists, they don't agree with it at all. They believe it was up there on the Temple Mount. Okay, so um, Eli Shukran, he's considered to be probably the leading biblical archaeologist in Israel. He's going to place it up there on, on the Mount, not down there in the city of David. And the religious Jews, and they're the only ones that matter, because they're the ones that will have the say, not a bunch of Christians looking on. They're the ones that matter. And again, um, the, the Sanhedrin and all of those that sort of have uh, a say in this, they're the ones that, you know, believe that they just, they actually have plans already to sort of put this addition onto the side of the Dome of the Rock. Now, for clarity, um, the Dome of the Rock, if you were to look at a map of the Temple Mount, okay, pretty much close to the middle um, is the Dome of the Rock. That's the gold dome. Right next to that is where the temple will be most likely, I would argue, rebuilt. To the south is Al-Aqsa Mosque. That's Al-Aqsa. That's the lead-domed mosque. That's the sacred mosque to Muslims. That's the one that they keep saying, the Jews are trying to invade it and all of these things. In the future, I would speculate that there'll be some type of agreement, some type of comprehensive agreement. Perhaps it will be a two-state solution with all sorts of guaranteed security, this type of thing. And part of that will be sharing not only Jerusalem, but the Temple Mount itself. The idea will be, yes, the Jews will have their temple over here. Down here is Al-Aqsa, and everyone's happy. Happy, 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 okay? It's amazing when you look at Revelation 11. That's exactly what it seems to describe. Here's the temple. Measure it. 
Don't measure the outer court. It's been given to the Gentiles. Now, throughout history, the Gentiles had access to the outer court. But when you read Revelation 11, it really seems to describe what you could very easily picture as a temple up there by the, by the Dome of the Rock, and then Al-Aqsa, and that whole area to the south, fully being given to the possession of the Muslims with some type of international peacekeeping security agreement to keep everybody happy. That's likely what I expect. Again, some of that speculation, but in light of the text, it really makes sense. I touched on this issue of it being an issue of tremendous controversy. Um, I think I touched on that enough. I could really do a whole session on, well, wait a minute, why will there be sacrifices in the millennium and that type of thing? And that really is a whole different issue. Maybe we'll even get to it later. Um, but I think for the sake of brevity and the sake of just being concise, it's important that we just kind of move on from there. But it is going to be an issue of tremendous controversy. We do need to be prepared for it. So amen and amen. I'm going to leave it right there. Uh, excited for next week as Dalton begins jumping into the issue of the two witnesses, more controversy to come, and then he'll wrap it up, um, wrap up chapter 11 with the issue of the seventh trumpet. So we're getting into some really, some really good stuff. So again, guys, thanks for sticking it out this week. I look forward to seeing you guys all next time. Until then, God bless. Have a fantastic week, and Maranatha.